Uh, Lisa Roby, Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. Fantastic presentation, love them all. Um, a lot of what you're talking about though, I wonder if the kind of business skills that you're talking about are something that we have in the health system. We're very focused on the clinical skills. Have we equipped our health services with the skills that will enable them to take advantage of these um, new technologies and the way our health system is evolving. So tell me what business skills you're thinking of. Well, I'm really thinking about the ability to read a market, to understand the impact of technologies, to uh, look at those future opportunities and the way that things like technology in particular are evolving and be able to see an opportunity, not see them as a threat. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we do some of that at uh, QT. We do, we're called Student Design Jams, and we're finding more and more corporates are wanting to access people that don't have, we call it domain knowledge. So someone from an engineering services company will say, can I get access to, say, 50 students? Can I give them five problems that I see in my business today? And can I ask them to, without any knowledge, but lots of knowledge of where they see the future going, can they give me suggestions about how they would solve it? And usually out of 10 or 12 suggestions over a four or five hour period, they pick up one or two, they grab two students, they bring them inside their business and they work out prototypes on it. That's one method um, because what you're identifying is the fact that when we've lived in an, and worked in a domain and we've got eminence in that domain that we've risen from a junior to a senior, we have along the way um, really focused in a very, and we don't see stuff outside of that domain, it becomes invisible. And there's also a practice in the strategy of imagining a, con a concept that's very different to what I operate today. It seems quite hard. So we, we're doing a fair bit of work in that. I think the degree that you probably did was a really useful part, which was a business degree and medical records. I have a brother that did that but degree. Let's well. just talk about reality check on this. Technology has been changing forever. You know, the fountain pen, um, you know, the horse and cart through to motorised transport. Forever, companies have had to confront new technologies threatening them and they've either adapted or they haven't. So Why are we suddenly talking about new skills? Haven't they been talking, teaching this in business schools from day one? I think that, uh, so to answer your question, Norman, I think they have been talking about this and learning about this. I sometimes feel that the curriculum in the education system sometimes isn't as progressed as what's happening out in the real world. To answer Lisa's question... Well, you make money out of this by telling people they don't know what to do and then we'll come in as Ernst & Young or Pricewaterhouse or whatever, mm. saying that we're going to solve your problems for you. But I'm saying this isn't new stuff. We've yeah, been doing it for centuries. In, the problem I see in health, and I, I don't see it in terribly many sectors, is that actually the eminence versus the evidence, right? So an eminence, someone will pull a string that says someone might die if that happens. And that brings what might be in a reimagining exercise of a, a substantial change to a network to a grinding halt. But that's not, so is that about business skills that Lisa's talking that's about? That's about structural barriers. And business skills are, pay, I see that we add business skills because we often will get the person that has to pay for that structure a minister, a, you know, someone that's got to, to fit up with the bill, and they'll say, we know we've got problems, but we've worked inside the system and we struggle to get um, ideas or suggestions or movement that will move out. So they'll often want to prototype separately. Mind you, what I am seeing, private sector, moving very fast, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's a two-speed economy um, going in the health reform business. For, for, for this group Sorry. here, just to add one final bit, um, I... Uh, the, the most advanced and business acumen hospital that I have seen in Australia is the Sydney Adventist Hospital, who are dealing with change, clinical adoption, and differences in the skill sets around their staff at great pace. Um, it's not a consultancy that's in there. Uh, there are really enthusiastic and passionate human beings who just love health. What I'm seeing, especially when I do that work, sorry, Norman, if I can just one say, is that there, there, there are people who are adapting on the job to do what they need to do and then going back and finding the necessary skills through education. But here's, here's the mm -hmm. thing. What happens in Sydney Adventist Hospital or St Stephen's mm -hmm. at Harvey Bay does not matter a jot when it comes to the health of Australia. I mean, it's nice, it's great, you've got an efficient hospital, we'll do it for less money and do more for less, fantastic. It's not going to, it's, it's the pimple on the pumpkin. It's not going to make any difference at all to the healthcare system. We're, you know, and I mean, Lisa's question is a good one, which is, 
It's not just business skills at uh, Princess Alexandra or the Royal Brisbane mm -hmm. Women's. This is business skills throughout the system and mitigating risk. I mean, these are big questions. Big questions. Mm. Can Liz? I also add up? Oh, sorry, Liz. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And I was just going to say, like, it's a great question, Lisa. But And, uh, like, what we do as well, um, and, you know, I'm the CEO of Pisa, I so Norman could also accuse me of I've got a thing to, but, you know, at least we're a non-profit. But the, the really important <laughs> thing is that I got into this space because I saw as a clinician a need, and, and that's what we're trying to do in health informatics. And clinicians are really incredibly smart people. So are the IT people and so are healthcare managers. Mm. So it's actually just a matter of being able to, to talk talk each other's language though and that's where um, upskilling in, in things like digital health is just enables you to actually apply the things that you already know to be true but to use language that enables you to have everybody around a similar viewpoint and take people on the same journey. But you're still talking about com uh, you know, adding complexity to an already complex system. Why are you adding complexity? Because you're asking for collaboration across complex areas rather than, I mean isn't the answer, in fact, what Monica was talking about, is that you organise around the simplest unit here, mm -hmm. which is the person. And what you're talking about mm -hmm. is more professionals talking about their own areas of eminence, and we'll share our eminence, but we're still not focusing and no, starting No, it doesn't have that. to be that way at all. Um, I completely agree with Monica, and that's how the healthcare system will change, because consumers will demand it. Um, but if you think that um, you're a profession and these are the boundaries of my profession and, you know, like I spoke at the physiotherapy conference last week and we were talking about, you know, because they need to protect their boundaries and I said, no, you don't. You need to protect the core of what you know and what makes physiotherapy different to GPs, different to OTs and nursing. You've all got unique skill sets. But the around the edges is where you need to be fluid because that's where the workforces of the future will work best and enable collaboration around the goals of the patient. Yes. Uh, yeah, Tony Brown, um, I'm uh, Director of Medical Services in the Taurus. Now, just to turn all this around, um, and I hope my Taurus people don't mind me speaking for them, but they have a model called the Taurus Model of Care. And what all this, they turn around, all you're talking about, it's actually, they don't, their biophysical model in, their, in the model is a very small part of their healthcare. They want connectivity to family, mm -hmm. to land, to be empowered to be what they were and to maintain that. Now, I haven't heard any of what you've been saying that's going to make their health better as far as they see it should be. Because they don't, in fact, they don't even have a digital connectivity because the um, systems are so bad in the Taurus. But they have boats and they travel between each other on boats and they talk and they have a, uh, not even a Western way of living. So I'm just wondering how, I think we're talking about a cultural, um, what we're talking about is a, is a culture taking over another culture. We're talking about a digital, Western, capitalistic, self-motivated ideal taking over the other systems that work. And the same with when I worked in Africa. They, mm. they have a much more family-orientated, land-based, you know, um, verbal culture. And I just wondered how all this is going to work for them because the Taurus people think that's going to change their outcomes, that's going to change their gap. So, so I'm going to go back to uh, what I spoke about and I think all of us spoke about and, and what Norman pointed out as well. It is about the consumer at the centre. Um, I think I made a point that we have to be very mindful of the consumer's digital preference, meaning you don't necessarily have to use digital all the time. I don't think it's about digital taking over things. I think it's a, it's a logical evolution of how do oh, the bits you're, and pieces... You're missing the point here. We're talking yeah. about access. Mm -hmm. okay. We are talking about access. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask a similar question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is you're all talking about middle class people who've got time on their hands and who are health neurotics. <laughs> you're actually not... I, when, I, when I listen to you talk, you're talking as if you're in a different world from the one I live in. Mm -hmm where you know, people wear their Fitbit for seven months, then they give it up. I mean, the, 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 we are not talking, you know, even people who are motivated don't do this. So this is a discussion about access to people who really need it, because the problems we are dealing with here are people who live, live 11 years shorter than other people. Mm -hmm. And is some Fitbit device going to solve that problem? Well, I'm open to that discussion, mm -hmm. but is a, 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 dig, is a a website for people over 60, part of that, it may be, but I want to hear that discussion because all I hear about is nice stuff to have if you're already well and your life expectancy is 93. 
Can I pick up on that? I mean, I, I think the, the term we use now is well-being because health is a subset of how I live my life. You know, how do I work, live and play? And that adds up to this index about health, which means how well do I believe I'm living? And I think I spend a reasonable amount of time uh, with Indigenous communities and I learn a lot from their practice. I learn a lot from the Stronger Smarter Foundation about, you know, engagement and check-in and, and the process they're using in and what they bring to our system. Um, I, I, I'm sorry if I've left the impression that I'm only catering to upper middle class people mm. that wear Fitbits. That is definitely not my intention and it's not where I spend my time in practice because the, the most wicked problems are the ones where the biggest divide exists, which is what you're pointing out. I don't think it's about so it's digitally you... enabled human contact, mm. right? And it's also about how do we bring that practice which is working for you into eminence so that we can replicate it. I think the learning actually, the more advanced I get, the more I'm going back to basics and saying, what can I do in my street? What can we do with our neighbours? What do I, how does wellbeing impact on this smaller area? And we're seeing models, yes, they're enabled by digital, but people are going back to very traditional practice um, about you know, things my grandmother did. I now take you know, uh, old practices of drinking you know, apple cider vinegar every day. Um, and when my grandmother told me that, I would have spat it out, right? Now I'm sitting as an urban whatever with my Fitbit drinking things that we had in old. There's a lot to learn from the old and we shouldn't be throwing it out. In fact, we should be exemplifying those use cases and really thinking and learning from that because they are about participation, not work. Mm. They are about tribes and relationships and a village moving and the, and the sustainability and the health of the village is important, much less so than my individual part of it. Mm. But all digital becomes in that environment is a facilitator. Co it's it's not an enabler. An enabler. It, it's not mm. core. L no. Louise? Look, absolutely. And look, if Tony, you know, if you live in an environment where digital isn't a thing because, you know, the NBN hasn't reached you yet, then, you know, I mean, we were here to talk about, the, you know, it's actually, yeah, it's really difficult for that but you know for a lot of Australia where it is and I'm from a relatively modest background myself and you know my parents never have the computer they'll, they'll never have an internet connection but you know and I'll say to my dad well what about if you could just use your television because how long the doctor how long does it take you to get in to see a doctor it takes months and I said well what about if you could just have a camera attached to your TV and you could have a chat with the doctor would that be useful to you and he's like that would be great and we so we can use technologies that are very simple and not about you know the people wearing Fitbits that can help everyday people improve their access to care yes I just wanted to uh, echo brothers uh, sentiments from the Torres Strait I'm a Torres Strait man myself um, I'm just going to speak on behalf of a consumer more so than my work profession um, and I think over time, or the time of millennium, we've seen um, the health system fail Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And that's been in history to where we are today. And from sitting on the outside looking in, I can see my counterparts struggling, sourcing and looking after <coughs> their own people. From an Indigenous point of view, <coughs> if those people can't help their own people, how are they going to help mine? Mm -hmm. And that's where they look at employing Indigenous people to come into the space and say, oh, we'll fix it through Indigenous people but it's still broken because it's still not going to escalate that indigenous person to help change or revolutionize the way we think health should be. So I think the real thing is that if we can, well, if you mob can fix your own issues out, it'll help us out greatly, <laughs> yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, and once that's fixed, all sweet, we're all part of the, the same network. So at the end of the day, the good test is when you get sick yourself and go for ED right through to discharge, you get to see how effect, effective our health system really is. And I've been failed many times. I've seen my mob failed many times. My parents failed many times. And eventually we're going to be the same people going through because the person on the other side of the screen is not going to talk to you anymore because he's going to be flicking his finger. Mm. So where is the real connectivity? And that's what we're getting lost in today. Mm. So thank you very much. And mm. great question. Yes. Thanks, Norman. Uh, hello, Matt Page from the Queensland Health Telehealth Program. I'd, I'd like to add a comment, if, I'm, if I may, off, off the back of these previous discussions, and, and surprisingly, telehealth didn't seem to come up much in, in this morning's talks. However, very much enjoyed the approach and the mentality that, that we need to use the digital technology tsunami that's ahead of us. We need to ride it, and we need to be riding on the crest of it and, and keep on top of it. But in terms of connectivity, I want to talk about politics with a big P. And Torres is a great example. 
We have the tools in Queensland Health now. We have a robust program that last year saw 50,000 consultations via telehealth. We have the tools to allow people to stay at home, to, to allow people to, to stay close to their family and their local supports. But we're hobbled constantly by the bigger picture and the bigger picture issues. NBN, where is it? it we, we desperately need it. Uh, we've got SkyMuster and that's making a difference. But we, we need our federal government to, to actually step up and recognise these issues. Uh, and until then, we really can't use the advantages that lay ahead of us in digital healthcare unless we have that underlying infrastructure in place. Yeah. And to allow people, I mean, people coming for a consultation for 15 minutes in Brisbane from a country area uh, have to travel for days. Yeah. And we're, we need to do something about that. Tony, look, thanks for that. And I just, look, I agree with you 100% and thank you for raising it. And that's one of the things that's really interesting with telehealth because that's been around forever. Like I first got involved in telehealth when it was over dial up. And, you know, that's tough. Um, but, you know, there's technical things except for the NBN in some places haven't been fixed yet. But that's the sort of stuff that what does concern me at, from an access and equity issue. Because while if telehealth, um, because the government is so bloody slow at doing what they need to do, now I actually can afford to, when I go to see my GP, I pay 40 bucks out of pocket. But, you know, it's a pain in the ass. I have to take half a day off and all this sort of stuff, right? So if there was a service, a private service that I could access, um, I, look, I think, well, I'm already 40 bucks as well when I go to see my GP. So if I could pay a subscription model or even just a one-off 40 bucks, I'm the same and I don't have to, like, all of the inconvenience. And I live in the city. So, you know, and I do think about all my family that live far away from the city if this was available. So if you can afford, I think what will actually, could actually happen, and I have huge concerns from an access and equity issue, is that if people like me can afford to go to private providers, they're not going to take the 40 bucks out of Medicare that they didn't have to use on me because I just paid for it privately and give it to someone who actually could use it. They'll just keep shrinking the healthcare budget. And it concerns me that there's a lot of organisations that are, um, and not government, there's a lot of private ones now offering telehealth consultations and good on them. I, you know, I think that's a good thing to do. But if we don't address the access and equity issues, you're going to take a whole lot of people out of the marketplace who will go privately and then they will just decrease the healthcare budget. Then, you know, and you see, and then you well, Hold, hold on a second. Issues. Why can't, in Holland, for example, it's entirely private? Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you know, and you just solve access problems by pricing and regulation. Um, Canada is almost entirely public. We've got a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. Just because it's private doesn't mean to say you can't solve. So come back to Lisa's question, oh, which I suspect is about mm. entrepreneurial mm. and commercial skills mm. as much as the business skills to understand right. where innovation is occurring. Is you know how do we nurture that and actually adapt it to the current system? I mean, one of the most uh, entrepreneurial organisations in this city is the uh, Institute for Indigenous Health, which really smart yeah. business organisation, commercially savvy, don't miss a dollar anywhere and apply it to what they need. It's like a, it's, it is effectively a private organisation, but providing a very good social purpose. Yeah. So, I mean, we shouldn't get too caught up here. And the question I was going to ask you is, are you finding disruptive technologies which don't rely on the infrastructure investment yes, which we're yeah. relying. So yeah. give us an example. And we're also finding um, new business models in terms of uh, using existing. So for instance, most hospitals actually have broadband. So if there's a mm. hospital in your district, what they don't have is a process about how they might broadcast that to a wider area. Post offices have them, so do um, Tats Lotto offices, and so do banks. So I'm now on a mission, I've been to Gundawindi, I'm going to Roma, I'm going to places where people say my MBN's gonna take me two years to get and I'm excluded. And we're now creating business models in local communities so you create to rebroadcast that re And what do you do about that? The because you heard a murmur there and everybody was thinking firewall. So how do you solve the firewall problem? We're working on that. And you just work one case at a time. It's not, we're not gonna change the world by you know the, the government waking up one day and it works. You've gotta do some experiments. And, I think we're out there. If we go back to the, the two questions that came out about um, our indigenous um, communities, what we're f I work a little bit with the Stronger Smarter Foundation and, and what, one of the things we don't talk a lot about is this um, unconscious bias or expectations management 
and, and Professor Chris Sara explained that a lot in the, in the education system and, and why the outcomes for education for Indigenous children and, uh, and other races were different. And it was because there was a massive unconscious bias or an expectation of when you walk in the door, uh, my expectation is, oh, OK, I see you. And regardless of how well you try and cleanse that, it just exists. So what you're um, so talking he's about is low expectations that. on the part of the teacher. And we're seeing the same in medical. I, I suspect, I haven't seen any evidence, but I suspect the same evidence that they use to bear on that education system exists in health and it exists in banking and it exists in business and, ex and it exists in other areas. So I think one of the things we can do is, is actually start to use the practices that he has into the health system. It's, it's got a very strong evidence base in education, yeah. what you're just talking about. Yes. Oh, hi. My name... My name's Judy Williams and I'm a consumer rep. I just wanted to tell you how um, shocked I was recently to visit a Queensland radiology practice and find they have an app now that I put on my smartphone and within five days I have my results and my images on my smartphone that I can take anywhere. So I had to ring them up and congratulate them and give them the app award of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> And it is an example of that, yeah. you know, and doesn't necessarily deny access to people without resources. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Kiddell. I'm from the PHN Darling Downs, West Morton. Um, I just want to say that... Is there anybody that left I'm in Darling Downs this Pardon? day? I mean, yeah. It sounds like half of Darling Downs is here today. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm actually a big supporter of this kind of innovation and the technolog technological advances we can have. Um, and I also... I dispute probably the, the position that it's for middle class people only. Um, I've just spent four or five years up in the territory working with some really remote communities. One of the biggest issues that we had up there was recruitment and retention within the medical practice. So I'm actually thinking of the beautiful um, story about the gentleman with the brain tumour mm. and how that sort of global perspective on treatment actually benefited him significantly in his, health, his wellness journey. Um, and that's something that we really looked for and we tried to innovate around up there. Um, and when we talk about people not having that personal access to some of those technologies, there are ways that we can help with that. Um, we, we petitioned multiple times to have those mobile um, access points that we could take out into those communities. It's not perfect, mm. but it's a step forward. And whilst mm. these in, um, innovations are being developed, it just means that later we know that we can probably put them in place. It mightn't happen straight away, and it certainly does happen in the cities first, mm. but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen in our remote spaces. Um, and in fact, there's a great need in those remote spaces for that knowledge and for um, the connection and, and communication that can come through some of those sort of um, technologies. So I think it's really important that we remember that as we're learning and growing things in a, in a city space, which, you know, you cast your eye when you're in a remote space down to the city and it's all happening there, but we can translate that back up into the remote spaces eventually, if not easily. Well, I'll kind of say something in response to that. I was in a discussion about three weeks ago about uh, North Territory, Northern Territory in particular, and how they're, how they're trying to use the, uh, the, the PCHR or the My Health Record in the community health sector a little bit more, a little differently. Um, obviously, there are some access issues around technology and Wi-Fi and, and, and broadband, etc. But they are finding uh, through some lessons learned that having that technology available and how they go out into the communities and be able to access the record as best they can um, is helping out. So I think you're absolutely right. I don't think we're here today to solve all the problems. What we need to be uh, mindful of is that there are always going to be those challenges and how do we start to think about the introduction of those when they're right, when the safety's right, when the clinical risk is right. You've covered privacy and security so that we can think about things a little bit differently. And it's really about seeding that innovation. Mm. So it's getting people mm. to think and it's growing that. And sometimes mm. it's going to take a long time to grow a mighty oak, but we're going to start somewhere, you mm. know. And like you said, there was a Healing Pathways project that we worked on, which was around um, e-case conferencing yep. to try and help these folks that were totally disconnected from all the providers that were helping them. Mm. You know, simple things that you can do in very remote settings, but it relies on technology that's being worked on in the cities. Mm. So. Well, maybe okay. just to pick up on that point about challenges, right? So one of the things that is transforming in the public sector is that we're, it's, it's going at glacial speed, but we are finally getting 
the, the procurement is the key, right? Because mm. procurement holds the keys to how money gets into the public good systems and gets operating. And those systems are very flawed. So what we're um, in, envisaging governments to do, and we're seeing it at the Fed level and the state level, and we're now seeing it at some city levels, is then to take some of that procurement money, money that they will spend anyway, and instead of saying, I know how I want that spent, and I want to buy this, and I want to buy this, and I want to buy this, and all the knowledge is already there, is actually take the problem, that, the outcome they want from that money, and put that into a challenge bank, and then invite the best and brightest to actually formulate new and innovative ways that they will do it. They will then still procure and so that no one dies in the process of this, but we get innovation at the fringes. So now we're on the mission. We've, we've, we're starting to get it in some of the departments. Health has not come to the party yet. We're looking at a, a, a measurement of 20% of procurement could go through a problem-centred um, innovation network and people would yeah. pitch up. Great. Thank you very much. Now, whenever I'm at a check-up conference and I smell the mushrooms, I know oh, we're yeah. just about time for morning tea, so oh, this is yeah. the final question. Thank you. Julie Mayer from the Western Queensland PHN. Thank you for the presentations. They're inspiring and they're great. And I guess the bit that I'd like to put on the table are two things. One, each of you spoke about systems and the impact of systems thinking. I think we need to go right back to look at our curriculums in our schools and yeah. our universities. They haven't been reviewed for a long time. Yeah. And I think if you look at any of the health professional curriculums, and I've lectured at university for a few years, none of them are taught to be business people, but really they're going out there to run a business. And when we hear about entrepreneurial skills, how do they then connect with their consumers and their customers? But I think the second side of the coin, and I guess this is my bandwagon, is that if we take what you're talking about and we go to the Torres Strait and we talk to people up there and say, how can we interpret this to fit your life and your, your model? You're going to get something that's a good fit. And the example I give is where we get funding, for example, for child and maternal health programs. And it's measured on how many women engage in child and maternal health services. No one went to the community to say, what's the best model, where the community simply says, if you have a woman doctor and our girls are taught, you miss a period, you go and talk to the woman doctor, you'll get connection very early on instead of at seven months. I mean, they're the sorts of things we're talking about. So when you're talking about technological connection, the Children's Hospital has had an app for years for children with cancer, mm -hmm. where they can go in and put the symptoms, the temperatures, everything else, and get their alerts, get their warnings, get their go to the nearest doctor, here's your nearest doctor to go to, even if they're travelling overseas. Those things are there, but they're not brought down to the base level where everyone does have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So instead of everyone having to buy a Fitbit that's outside their price range, let's do things that are on the equipment they've got mm -hmm. in the locality where they're at so they can get the outcome they need, yeah. which takes us right back to our checkup model, which is right service, right place, right time. Yeah, and, and I, I spoke about um, life events and circumstances. I'm a big, I'm a big fan for circumstances based on community. Uh, it's not one size fits all, and 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 that's that's sometimes my concern around the 165,000 health apps that are out there. Um, so we have to be quite mindful. I think what PwC does around their uh, student jams um, is is interesting and fantastic because I've actually seen them. I think how you get the consumer or the community involved in the design mm. is, is, is the most important bit. And if you talk about outcomes-based purchasing, and you were talking about maternal and child services, what are the outcomes you're actually looking for? Most maternal and child services are not designed to build the outcomes that we would expect from there. So, I mean, mm -hmm. and technology is only part of that story. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that excellent question. Mm -hmm.